Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Nisha Shetty, an oral and maxillofacial surgeon consultant with Manipal Hospitals. I'm here to debunk the myths of orthognathic surgeries, also known as jaw corrective surgeries, or corrective jaw surgeries. Uh, corrective jaw surgeries go a long way. They've been performed for more than 150 years by various surgeons now. Uh, these are designed to correct conditions in the upper jaw, in the lower jaw, to improve the airway of the patients, to correct disorders of the joint, that is the jawbone joints, and also to correct malocclusions, problems primarily because of the skeletal deformity that persists, because of the growth disorders that persists as an individual attains complete growth. Dental deformities alone can be corrected by orthodontic treatment where an orthodontist who is a specialist in aligning the teeth corrects it when the child is growing, generally starts by the age of 11, 12 and finishes it within 2 to 3 years. But when there is a skeletal as well as a dental uh, deformity, meaning the size of the jawbone is very big, very small, or the airway is very constricted, or speech is an issue, or the child or the adult is suffering from some kind of a sleep uh, disorder. These are the conditions. Any kind of disharmony in the upper and the lower jaw is when these jaw corrective surgeries are warranted. Uh, a lot of pe people ask me, when, is, when are these surgeries uh, required? Is it really important to do these surgeries? I would say it is not a purely aesthetic correction or a cosmetic surgery. It is primarily done to correct the functions for the individual. Functions meaning ability to chew better, ability to breathe better, to improve the airway of the patient and also medical conditions such as obstructive sleep apnea. The most common reason why these corrective jaw surgeries are done is because of uh, dental and skeletal disharmonies. Uh, it's usually the patient has severe overbite, an underbite, a deep bite, a cross bite. That is when the lower jaw is really protruded, the upper jaw is really retruded or uh, the opposite of it or the chin is very small uh, or the oral cavity per se has a very less volume in these conditions it is warranted it cannot be just corrected dentally it's when a surgical intervention is needed to improve the function uh, also some sort of childhood injuries can lead to a, a deformed development of a particular bone especially the lower jaw bone or the upper bone uh, or upper jaw bone in such situations, once the growth and development of the individual is completed, it may warrant for these jaw corrective surgeries. In certain situations, there are these chronic TM joint pains that the patient has. It's called as, this condition is called as TMD, temporomandibular disorder, which is treated by conservative means most of the time or with certain arthroscopic procedures. But in certain situations, it may warrant or require jaw corrective surgeries. So this is also one of the indications of orthognathic surgeries. Orthognathic means straight jaw. Orthognathic doesn't literally mean that we make the jaw straight, but we make the jaw, uh, uh, you know, we achieve a harmonious balance between the upper and lower jaw. And in the process, a good airway, good function is also achieved and also uh, life changing aesthetic changes the way the cosmetic changes, the way the patient appears also is achieved. These surgeries are needed in conditions when the teeth don't meet at all. In certain individuals, it is seen that only 20% uh, of the back teeth only meet and they have open bite. They are not able to bite on well, which leads to various other problems because they are not, not able to digest the food that they are eating well. And, uh, you know, there is a lot of functional issue. They are unable to close their lip. The competence of the lip is lost where they develop upper respiratory tract infections. In such situations, 
just by dental correction with braces it is not possible to correct these conditions in such situations uh, uh, corrective jaw surgery is generally you know uh, looked upon as in that is the only way by which we can achieve the functional loss which the patient has another large uh, area that i want to highlight is obstructive sleep apnea this is a uh, a, a branch of medicine that is really not given that much of importance but now it is really uh, people are very aware of what obstructively sleep apnea is so generally in people who snore a lot there is a lot of apnea hypopnea ahi index what is called that is uh, altered uh, meaning their heart and their brain and their vital organs are receiving le less uh, blood supply uh, in sleep that's because of a compromised airway uh, there is a specialty called a sleep medicine which deals with it so generally it is treated uh, using uh, these conditions are treated using cpap machines these are machines which help the patient uh, ventilate positively when they are sleeping so that the amount of distress to these vital organs is reduced but in uh, certain situations despite of that the the patient's ahi apnea hypopnea index doesn't improve uh, then uh, also a lot of weight loss programs the patients are put in or uh, dentists give maxillary mandibular advancement splint these are devices that are worn in the mouth when worn in the mouth when the patient sleeps and despite of all this in certain situation uh, if the there is no improvement uh, there are certain non invasive surgical procedures like the, a soft palate repair to improve airway is done and still if it fails then the last resort is generally a maxillary mandibular advancement meaning moving of the entire upper jaw that is along with the dental segment and the skeletal bone moved forward and the lower jaw advanced forward brought forward thereby in proving the volume of the oropharyngeal airway has shown considerable results in treating these conditions as well uh so uh, it, it's not generally only for cosmetic reasons that orthognathic surgeries are done it is done for various other reasons generally we wonder what is the right time to do the surgery when a child hits puberty growth spurt that's when the parent starts noticing that oh the lower jaw is very protruded the upper face is very retruded meaning uh, uh, very small or the patient uh, the child always keeps the mouth open and breathes through the mouth he is unable to close his mouth properly usually most of these conditions correct because the rate at which the lower jaw and the upper jaw may vary uh, differently in different individuals usually it gets corrected so we ideally wait for a time where the growth and development has stopped after which only the patients are generally taken for orthognathic surgery this is a very debatable topic it's of, of course on the surgeon's preference as well but generally uh, patients younger than 15 years of age especially girls younger than 15 years of age or boys younger than 18 years of age are not taken up for uh, corrective jaw surgeries um so what is the outcome that you are look the parent looks at is an instant improvement in the bite the moment the bite improves the the, the ability to digest food is better uh the patient starts enjoying eating his food better because he is able to chew and uh, experience the joy of chewing and also in the bargain uh, there is also a lot of facial appearance improvement meaning uh, when the jaw is very uh, protruded and we are retruding it there is a drastic change that the patient and you know his peers and people around them will know that there has been something drastic that has happened because it is quite a life changing aesthetic changes that uh, that can be achieved with these surgeries uh, with somebody who has a very retruded upper jaw and we are bringing it out or we are setting it back even in such situation there's a huge profile change the simplest of corrective jaw surgery is a chin surgery which is called as genioplasty 
so where only a small it's a very uh, it's the most uh, simplest of jaw corrective surgeries so in when we do these surgeries it's just the profile that changes so which is also very drastic and noticeable by people and peers around them so uh, there's a lot of uh, other issues that uh, you know the patient comes with along with uh, uh, beyond the skeletal uh, deformity that is there is the uh, psychosocial baggage that they come with generally as the child is growing in school they are uh, given certain tags or names you know wherein uh, they are bullied by their peers that they are always wearing certain growth develop growth and development appliances and this kind of creates a stigma in them they so so they come with a lot of baggage so it is very important for um, as we understand their their uh, the psychological issues and they are also put through uh, a good uh, psychological counseling before and after the procedure because sometimes the results can be really overwhelming uh, even accepting the new look becomes a challenge for the individual so this is very relative depending on uh, the individual patient but the team generally treating these conditions always takes care that the psychological aspect of the patient is also taken care of so generally what will this treatment involve is what uh, uh, what is asked like from the parent or the individual himself if he is coming much later in life uh, let me broadly divide the patients who come to us into three segments one is uh, patients who who are brought in uh, during their growing uh, phase uh, by the parent when they are uh, very young meaning uh, the parent notices that uh, they have a very long lower jaw or they have a retruded lower jaw there is an airway issue or they have some thumb sucking habit which has been so severe that has led to you know a very high arched jaw so in such situations when we catch the child very young or when we diagnose the children very young uh, it is uh, easier to correct it with non invasive methods where the there is a preventive uh, a pediatric dentist and an interceptive orthodontist who looks into this and helps them overcome these habits and correct it conservatively with dental appliances but after a while in certain situations it is not able to uh, we are not able to correct everything non surgically certain cases it is uh, surgery is definitely warranted to improve the function and aesthetics of the growing child so we usually see catch these patients very young so they undergo uh, orthodontics from around 14 15 years of age before the surgery so the this uh, this whole jaw corrective surgery is a huge team work where a pediatric dentist an orthodontist that is somebody who aligns the teeth an oral and maxillofacial surgeon uh, a psychologist uh, who is um, you know an expert in dealing with the uh, child psychology as well as a dietitian play a very important role so it's like a multidisciplinary approach so the orthodontist plays a very very important role in this because uh, he or she will work on the patients before surgery and create a platform for the surgeon where he can precisely do what he needs to do there are a lot of photographs which are taken documented studied using various software with the advent of 3d printing life has become very easy for us in the last 3 4 years we uh, we make multiple ct scans of the face and we 3d print it we do mock surgeries or lit literally virtual surgeries and we show the patient the outcome of the surgery even before we do the soft tissue as well as the hard tissue changes that we are we are planning to achieve is discussed with the patient or the parent 
and then it is planned. So the orthodontist works for about two thirds of the entire treatment happens before the surgery and then the surgery happens following which again the orthodontist uh, comes in and they completely settle the bite for us and uh, we stabilize what we have achieved and the patient is then uh, free to go. This is generally in the younger patients, this is the scenario. So what we also do is lot of mock drills on casts and models. We make impressions of the mouth and around the area and we do a lot of mock exercises before the surgery so that the predictions of our surgery is very, very precise. So the, it, it's all in millimeters. Everything is calculated. There's a lot of mathematics that goes, a lot of tracings that are done of the skeleton of the soft tissue. And then this planning is done by the team which is treating the patient. So generally after the surgery is done and after surgery orthodontics is done, uh, we also put the patient on retainers for a long time and stabilize the bite and then the patient is free to go. So in these corrective jaw surgeries, what happens is that a particular jaw bone is intentionally broken. In uh, I mean that we make osteotomies, that is we break the bone and move it forward, backward, upward, downward, depending on whether we are dealing with the upper jaw, the lower jaw or both jaws together and then they are stabilized in the new position. The new position is verified using certain, uh, you know, like a uh, splint. We use it and then we verify that the outcome is correct and then the new position is maintained by using mini screws and plates made out of titanium to fix and stabilize these bones in this position. All these procedures, all these extensive jaw corrective procedures are done from inside the mouth. We don't really cause any scar from outside. It is mostly all the stitches or whatever the sutures are placed inside the mouth. And so the oral hygiene of the individual is supposed to be very, very good and optimal and it has to be maintained before, during as well as after the surgery. Uh, just to warrant no other infections or complications as such. So uh, that is about primarily how the pre, intra and post operative course of this uh, procedure takes. Um, so uh, very rarely or uh, very often we also have to correct the position of the nose. So a bit of uh, a change in the shape of the nose is what the patient will see in the whole process or sometimes a rhinoplasty is also done along with this if if that is a concern or uh, if a DNS correction is needed uh, then it is done along with these surgeries as well. Uh, so that is about the course of the surgery. What are the risks associated with this corrective jaw surgeries? The most common uh, problems or rather in any extensive surgery which goes beyond uh, two hours or three hours uh, is swelling in the lips. The patient ha sees a lot of swelling after the surgery in the face. Uh, <clears throat> the swelling may last for as long as up to three weeks to completely resolve. But there is still 10% swelling which remains for up to six months. So we normally counsel and tell the patients that the true outcome of this whole procedure is should, gen I mean, we generally assess the outcome, the soft tissue outcome, that is how the face or the profile looks like only six months after the procedure. But the functional outcomes, meaning ability to chew well, ability to breathe well, improvement of the oral, all this is no, is literally instant after a, uh, two, three weeks, once all the edema subsides, the patient is very uh, comfortable and, uh, you know, uh, ready to go. Uh, numbness is uh, something that, yes, could happen, especially in lower jaw surgery where we do a lot of advancement of a uh, lot of setback. So in which the lower jaw, including the entire teeth section, is 
sliced up and there is an important nerve which is uh, which is uh, a sensory nerve which supplies the, your feeling of touch and pressure it, which supplies your lower lip and uh, you know the lower part of your face may uh, undergo a bit of stretching trauma so they might be a bit of swelling around the nerve so the patient might have some neurologic symptoms for some times after surgery which is generally explained well in advance before the surgery to the patient but um, otherwise it usually resolves in uh, two to three weeks and the patient is back to normal in extensive surgeries uh, we generally ask the patient to refrain from going to work or college or school for at least 10 14 10 to 14 days but if the swelling lasts for longer it's maximum up to three weeks that we ask the patient to refrain from uh, you know uh, exposing themselves because of the uh, it's a bit of a stigma to walk around with that much of swelling around now infection of the plates beneath the gums is another common issue so hence a lot of counseling happens on the oral hygiene on how they are going to maintain the oral cavity because with so many stitches inside in the mouth it's a little difficult and they have braces on so it may be a little difficult but we also use certain devices like a water flosser which aids them in maintaining the hygiene of their oral cavity and it makes life easy for them uh, another uh, important constraint that is there after these surgeries, their diet. You're literally on smoothies or, you know, soups, smoothies or soft diet, mushy food for up to three weeks. Because we are literally fracturing a bone and then rejoining it. The jaw, jaws are the areas of your head and neck or uh, the part of your body which cannot be splinted like when, when you have a fracture in your hand or an osteotomy you can splint it with a cast but your mouth is one area where you are constantly using it when you're talking, when you're eating. So hence to avoid any strong impact on the healing bone the patient is advised to be on a completely soft diet for up to three weeks or little longer sometimes and uh, once the bones heal the osteotomies heal then the patient slowly graduates to eating uh, slightly solid food and then hard food uh, whatever appeals them once the wounds have healed well uh, in certain situations we may achieve an ideal bite during surgery and immediately post-op we might lose that bite in such situations the orthodontist again uh, comes to our rescue and uh, uh, gives the patient certain kinds of elastics to wear on the braces to settle the bite so that there is an ideal perfect bite that the patient achieves uh, in the post course relapse after surgery is also very unusual However, there may be a relapse in the position of the jaws and the teeth, uh, which may require in certain, but this is very, very rare due to some reason, there could be a relapse, unforeseen reasons, there could be a relapse, but very, very unlikely because we monitor the patients constantly. The patients are monitored, um, of course, they are in-house. Generally, if you are doing a bi-jaw surgery, at least for five days, four to five days, the patient is in the hospital. So they are monitored on a daily basis, followed, following which on a weekly basis they are seen. The hygienist is constantly um, watching on the oral hygiene of the patient. The nutritionist takes care of the post-op nutrition of the patient and the orthodontist and the surgeon are on constant vigil so that the surgical outcome is maintained and the wound healing happens uneventfully. So generally, uh, if the procedure is very small, wherein only a small segmental surgery, only the anterior small part of the jaw is osteotomized or and moved front back or a chin job is done, the patient requires to stay in the hospital for just about two days, 48 hours or maybe three days, 72 hours. They are discharged and they resume uh, their work very quickly. Uh, and uh, care after surgery again is very important a lot of psychological as I said earlier psychosomatic uh, changes uh, they come with the psychosomatic uh, psychosocial baggage 
so uh, we work constantly along with the parent relative pairs to you know heal them faster so they they turn out to be much more confident much more um, uh, respectful about it they start loving their own self so it is quite a life changing process for a lot of patients depending on what kind of uh, uh, procedure we do on them um when i suggest when i see a skeletal deformity and i counsel the patient or the parent that Uh, you know you might require this procedure to achieve this then they ask me is it cosmetic most of the time uh, uh, co- uh, the aesthetics of course is very very important we are uh, there to uh, provide the ideal aesthetics but also it is primarily because of function inability to eat properly having constant headaches inability to close the mouth properly inability to breathe through the nostril properly uh, obstructive sleep apnea these are the various other functional reasons for which these corrective jaw surgeries are done so hence i would uh, you know i always um, choose to disagree that it's purely cost it's done for purely cosmetic uh, reasons uh, in certain situations when there is a childhood uh, injury then in such situations also um uh, suppose there is a injury or to the chin or something like that in such situation the child's jaw stops growing due to the uh, injury to the bone and uh, they have lot of difficulty in opening the mouth and they may have a very protruded chin so in such situations we also do something called as distraction osteogenesis where the bone is grown back to its original position so this also is classified under orthognathic it's an advanced orthognathic surgery where we do distraction osteogenesis to grow and achieve the ideal uh, height of the of whatever we are uh, we are trying to achieve there's a huge profile change that happens so um, now with the advent of 3d technology the uh, there is no uncertainty here the patient will clearly have an idea of what we are going to achieve and we are able to physically show it in the form of uh, you know uh, we have softwares to show the outcome to the uh, patient meaning how the new bite is going to be how their profile is going to change and uh, even uh, you know how the photograph is going to you know we can morph the photographs and show them as to what outcomes we are looking at to uh, uh, to achieve in such situations and um, since it is a multidisciplinary uh, procedure where multiple specialists are involved uh, and in which the orthodontist plays a uh, a uh, much longer relationship role with the patient uh, it's a literally a journey of getting uh, to where they are that we go along with the patient because anyway between 1 and 1/2 to 3 years is what uh, it takes to complete the entire treatment in certain situations you have um, um a young adult who's about say 24 25 years coming in to us and saying that you know they're getting married in 3 months 4 months generally it's uh, like quick fix jobs uh, are not recommended because there is a way a systematic way where uh, if we decompensate do the uh, decompensate the bite do the surgery and then settle the bite is when we will achieve optimal results but in certain situations we do um uh, instant uh, procedures but i always encourage patients to do it the right way that is go through the orthodontist and the team assesses we see what needs to be done and then we help them a lot of parents uh, uh, of uh, come with concern that will my child need surgery do you think so in such situations i always tell them it's very uh, i mean in certain situations very easy for us to know that sure shot this child will require surgery when they grow up uh, you know studying the pattern of growth a facial growth that they come to us with but in certain certain situations as they grow their lower jaw which might be growing at a very fast pace uh, pace at a certain age might just you know the upper jaw might just pace up with it and the, it might just get corrected and just with orthodontic treatment that is treatment of orthodontic purely is dental correction 
uh, with minimal skeletal corrections which can be done when we start very young with children we can achieve what we need to achieve but in certain situations where there's a severely compromised airway or uh, you know uh, in such situations uh, jaw corrective jaw surgery is 100% warranted another important situation is birth defects children born with cleft lip and palate who undergo these surgery correction corrective surgeries of cleft lip and palate very young when they are like less than uh, one year or uh, you know lesser and as they grow up they invariably uh, have some sort of skeletal uh, deformity which may require jaw corrective surgeries so again here the orthodontist plays a very important role where they do the pre uh, surgical uh, workup uh, which uh, takes away two third of the time of the entire treatment and then a surgical correction is done followed by a maintenance phase again by the orthodontist so here the speech therapist also plays a very important role and um, along with the speech therapist we deliver what needs to be delivered to the patients with who have a congenital anomaly or what is called as a birth defect so i think i pretty much covered uh, most of the things in corrective jaw surgeries which a common person who is looking for it would uh, want to know and uh, these surgeries have very 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 predictable outcome uh, with better function better mastication that is better chewing of food uh, better airway uh, better uh, sleep uh, better appearance better psychosocial uh, life you know and overall it is truly a gratifying uh, surgery for us unlike uh, you know when it's trauma and all that it's a very focused here it's a journey with the patient so we kind of grow with the patient seeing them uh, transform and it's truly gratifying for us uh, maxvac surgeons to um, look up these cases and help them out and help them achieve a better quality of uh, life um someone's asking me how long is the process of these surgeries now again uh i understand you're trying to ask me how long does this surgery take that is how long is the operation so generally it depends on what we are trying to do if it's a simple chin job it will be done within an in less than an hour's time but if it is um extensive by jaw procedures where both upper and lower jaws are involved then it can go up to 5 6 hours as well or longer in certain situations so uh, but generally the hospital stay varies anyway between uh, 72 hours for longer procedures between seven up generally not more than 5 days 5 6 days we keep the patients in house in some situations immediately after surgery if the swelling is very very uh, large meaning the tongue can swell up a lot because we are literally playing around the floor of the mouth which is very important so because of the so much of maneuvering of the lower jaw we see a lot of edema in the uh, tongue in such situations we keep the patient in intensive care for about a night after surgery and once the swelling uh, reduces we move them out to the post operative uh, to the room or the ward so that is the thing are there any questions let me look up yeah so i think i pretty much covered let me look up for questions can snoring be reduced without surgery uh yes it can be there is a special specialty called as sleep medicine you can reach out to the sleep physician and there is a, a sleep study which is performed and we see what is your ahi index based on that um, the doctor will uh, prescribe either a uh, a machine or a splint or a device to be worn and it can be corrected non surgically most of the time it is corrected non surgically or um, there are sleep medicine dentists who will give you a splint to wear after you've seen the physician so you wear something on in the mouth like a like a sports guard which looks similar to a sports guard but it is a sleep device and that reduces your uh, snoring uh, your uh, 
snoring considerably. But here it's not just reduction of the snor snoring, it is certain parameters that we look at. If how much damage it is causing to your vital organs. So in such situations, there is airway surgeries which are done. The simplest surgeries which is least invasive is the soft palate surgery where we, you know, uh, stitch up the soft palate and thereby increase the volume of your oropharynx. Uh, only in situations after doing all of these where the patient has improved his BMI, has lost a lot of weight, done everything, yet is not able to overcome these problems. So obstructive sleep apnea by itself is a big science and there are specialists who can help you with this and if need be, they will refer you out to us for uh, jaw corrective surgeries. But most of the times it can be corrected non-surgically for sure. Are corrective surgeries reversible? Mm, to a certain extent, yes, they are. They can be reversed, but it is quite an exercise. There hasn't been a situation wherein we have had to reverse it, but it can be reversed in most uh, situations. So, yeah, I think uh, I've pretty much covered most of it. Thank you for hearing me out and um, it has been a pleasure coming live on Facebook. Thank you so much.